wait just a couple more, another minute or two for some more people to filter in, but it looks like the numbers are starting to slow down. All right, we've crossed the 100 attendees mark and seems like the numbers are starting to slow down a bit. So I think we can get started with the introduction. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dustin Myers-Levy. I'm uh, one of the seven week juniors lab leaders and we are joined here by Alec Karkatsanas. Oh, sorry, did I, I feel like I butchered that. <laughs> um, All good. Uh, he is a the founder and executive director at the Civil Rights Corps, and he is a new book out called Un called Usual Cruelty, the Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal and Justice System uh, from 2019 that's available now and is a fantastic read for, you know, learning about this topic. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Alec. Oh, uh, before we get started. Uh, we're going to be doing the Q&A a little bit differently than we have for some of the other lectures in that rather than having just a dedicated block of time at the end of this to Q&A, we will be interspersing questions uh, throughout. So submit any questions you have via the Zoom Q&A function or via the Google form that you all should have access to. And I will intersperse those questions as necessary and Alec will answer them. Thank you so much, Dustin. Uh, it's great to be here. I know it would have been nicer to do this in person, but uh, I hope that this will be useful for all of you. And I'd like to share a little bit about my perspective on the American criminal system and, and some of the work that I've been doing. But I also want to highlight what Dustin said. I think this will be most useful if all of you are able to ask questions and for me to respond to the things that are on your mind, the things that you're seeing um, in your local communities and things that you're thinking about, particularly in this moment of incredible energy in this country around the issues of, of how our criminal punishment bureaucracy uh, is functioning. So um, please just, you know, add questions into the Q&A box um, and, uh, and I'll try to answer them as, as we go and, and Dustin can, can jump in every few minutes and make sure I'm, I'm not missing any. So I thought maybe what I would do is start by telling you a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing over the last few years and how I arrived at some of the the ideas that I've, that I've arrived at with, with respect to the book and with respect to the, the civil rights work we've been doing around the country and, and then maybe um, start answering some of your questions about some of that work. So um, I graduated from law school um, in 2008 and uh, I became a public defender and I was a public defender first in Alabama and then in Washington DC. And my role was to uh, represent people who um, were accused of crimes but were too poor to afford their own attorney. And in the process of doing that work, I learned a great deal about the pain and the cruelty that um, the criminal punishment bureaucracy inflicts on millions of people and their families every single year. Um, after a few years of being public defender, I realized that I, I wanted to move beyond representing individual people in individual cases and to um, uh, try to attack the injustices in the system in a more systemic way. And I got a grant from Harvard, um, which is where I'd gone to law school, um, and to, to, to let me just start a nonprofit that would go around the country and challenge these systems. And the first thing that I did um, when I got the money from, from Harvard was I 
um, I got a plane ticket back to Alabama and I, and I rented a car and I drove from courtroom to courtroom and jail to jail and city to city. And I just sat in the back of courtrooms and I watched um, what was going on. And then, then I interviewed people and their families as they were leaving and I went up into the local jails and I interviewed people. And that trip really changed the course of, of my career. Um, I'll never forget that the, the um, morning I got to Montgomery, Alabama, which is where I used to be a public defender. And um, uh, I went into the local courtroom. There were 67 people um, in jail garb, um, chained together. Um, all of them were black. And as I watched the proceedings go on that morning, I noticed that not one of them was charged with a crime. They were all there, confined in a jail cell, brought to court in chains because they owed money to the city from old debts. Um, most of them were from traffic tickets from years earlier. Um, I later then um, took some notes and then I went up into the jail and I started calling out the names of the people who I'd seen in court. And those people whose names I called out became my first clients as a civil rights lawyer. And for example, the first woman that I met there, Sharnell Mitchell, whose story I tell a little bit in the book, um, was um, given a court document that said, pay us $2,807 or do 59 days in jail. And Charnel explained to me that she'd been sitting on her couch with her one-year-old on her lap and her four-year-old next to her when the police raided her house, took her away from her children and put her in a jail cell because she owed debts to the city of Montgomery. And, um, you know, as she showed me this document, she explained, if you couldn't afford to pay your debts, they let you sit your debts out at $50 a day. So for every day she sat there, $50 would go off her debt. And on days that, that she um, agreed to work for the city uh, to clean the blood and the feces and the mucus and the mold and the urine off the jail floors and walls, um, she would get an extra $25 a day. So on those days, she'd make $75. And she was desperately in pencil on the back of her court documents trying to calculate how much money she was earning every day, 75, 75, 50, 50, just to figure out when she could get back to her kids. And we filed, um, as I mentioned, Charnel and, and the other people I met that day became my first clients as a civil rights lawyer. Uh, we filed a, a federal class action lawsuit within a few weeks. Um, uh, the city, instead of defending this lawsuit in court, when the federal court started asking questions about how this could be happening, um, they just released everybody from the jail. And that was a really, Really powerful moment um, for me because it, it highlighted again um, how desensitized our society has become to putting human beings in cages. That we can be putting people in cages, filling up a local jail for no good reason at all. You have to understand that this, this situation in Montgomery was taking, contact, taking place in the context of a society, American society right now, that is putting human beings in cages at rates that are unprecedented in the recorded history of the modern world. We are putting 2.3 million people in cages right now. There are 300,000 people in jail right now in solitary confinement. Um, there are 450,000 human beings in jail right now because they can't pay money bail prior to being convicted of anything, um, awaiting their trial. Uh, we, have, uh, we cage people at five to 10 times the rates of other comparably wealthy countries. We jail people at five times our own national historical average until 1980. And, and you know, this is not some random distribution of the population. We are caging poor people almost exclusively. We are caging disproportionately black people, brown people. Um, this uh, current American punishment bureaucracy, which is the term that I use for what other people call the justice system, this punishment bureaucracy cages black people at a rate six times out of South Africa at the height of apartheid. It's in that context that I started going around the country and watching court in dozens and dozens of cities and counties and states all over the country. And shortly after we won that case in, in Alabama, Michael Brown was, was murdered in Ferguson. And um, I, I flew to, to St. Louis and, and embedded myself with a lot of the people that were protesting in the streets in Ferguson and went from house to house and conducted this amazing series of interviews with people about what was going on in their community. And, and I learned in that investigation um, that Ferguson averaged 3.6 arrest warrants per household, almost all of which were for unpaid debt. Still, five or six years later, we still have our lawsuit going against the city of Ferguson. I still have not found a single white person that this applied to in Ferguson. The city of Ferguson would tell people, um, you owe us some money. 
um, we're going to arrest you. We're going to keep you in a jail cell. If your family can bring us $100 in cash, $200 in cash, we'll let you go. Um, if they can't, we're going to keep you here until we determine that we can no longer extract any more money out of you. And then maybe we'll let you go later. And this happened to hundreds of people each year, thousands of people over the period of a few years that I studied. And what became really clear in the wake of Ferguson was that this wasn't just a, a problem that was isolated in, in Montgomery, Alabama or Ferguson, Missouri. This was the norm in thousands of jurisdictions all over this country. And as we started prevailing in these lawsuits in federal court on the theory that no human being should be put in a cage because she can't make a monetary payment, it occurred to me that um, this same principle was the foundation of the American money bail system. The only difference between the cases that we had in Ferguson and Montgomery where people were being jailed after they were convicted of some kind of traffic or minor criminal offense in those places. But in the money bail system, people are jailed, taken away from their children, their schools, their homes, their families, their churches, their jobs, their communities. They're taken away prior to being convicted of anything. And I'll never forget at the end of 2014, after I'd spent a bunch of time in Ferguson, I went to a meeting at the DOJ in Washington, DC, which I call the Department of Injustice. And uh, I remember telling them there that um, I was preparing to file lawsuits around the money bail system all over the country. And people just sort of laughed. They said, we use the money bail system to determine who's in jail and who's not in jail in over 3,000 cities and counties around the country. Um, we just do it every day. Good luck with that. And so on January 15th, 2015, um, I uh, brought the first major challenge to the American money bail system uh, since the rise of mass incarceration. And that morning, I, I went to a local jail and and I asked them who they'd arrested in the previous few days and they gave me a list and I, I walked over to the, um, I went to the police station and they told me who they'd arrested. Then I walked over to the local jail and I started calling on people's names. And that's the morning that I met Christy Don Varden. Um, and Christy uh, was in a really difficult state as, as those of you um, who have family or loved ones who've been arrested. It's, it's an incredibly traumatic and difficult process. Christy was accused of shoplifting from a Walmart and she couldn't afford to pay a few hundred dollars to get out of jail, so she didn't know where her children were. She was panicking. She was crying. She told me that the night she got arrested, she was so distraught um, because she didn't know where her, her, her little kids were and, and she wanted to be at home that she couldn't stop crying and screaming. And so the jail um, took her out of the cell and into a little hallway, in a little corner in the hallway where there's no security cameras. And they have a chair that they keep there with straps on it. And they strapped Christy to that chair and they just tased her over and over and over again. And that morning that I met her, I took photographs of all of the wounds on her body from the taser. This is what our jails and prisons have become. Um, you have to understand when we have a conversation about mass incarceration and the money bail system and our local jails, um, we have allowed our local jails to become places where people contract infectious disease. They are sexually and physically assaulted. Um, they are deprived of all of the basic things that we all take for granted, like um, nutritious food, sunlight, exercise, the ability to hug our mother or father or our child or our brother or sister. Um, and, and this is what Christy experienced and, and with enormous courage, you know, in a moment of extreme vulnerability for her. She said to me, I want to, to be a part of this lawsuit. I want to be um, involved in something that makes sure that this doesn't happen to anyone ever again. And um, later that afternoon, I, I drove, sped back to, to, um, the, to my office. We, we um, finished the legal papers. We filed this case. It was the first case challenging the money bill system in a generation. And sure enough, um, within a few weeks, the, the federal government itself had weighed in on our lawsuit and, and agreed with us that it's unconstitutional to keep someone in a jail cell just because they can't pay. And in the first 10 months of 2015, I filed 12 of these lawsuits in 12 different cities in five or six different states. And since then, over the last few years, there's been an incredible movement led by the people who've been directly impacted by these issues. Um, there's been incredible public consciousness raised by the death of Khalif Browd or the death of Sandra Bland. And now all of a sudden, um, around the country, people are asking questions about how can it be that the way we're deciding who's in jail and who's out of jail with their families has to do with how much money they have in their wallet. Um, and so we've been engaged in, in that work ever since. And we've had some major victories. So we won a lawsuit, for example, 
um, in Houston, which is, is now resulting in about 19,000 people every single year just in Houston alone not being jailed after being charged with misdemeanor offenses because they can't pay money. Um, we've won cases all over the country in Tennessee and Louisiana and Georgia and in Illinois. And um, we won a case striking down the money bail system in California. And yet, um, when, you, when you take a step back, and this is really what I was, what I was getting at in, in the book, Usual Cruelty, which I hope you have a chance to read because it's really an attempt to explain exactly how our criminal punishment bureaucracy works, how it functions as a tool of white supremacy and capitalism, how it preserves the wealth of people who own things in our society. Um, what, I was, what I was getting at in that book is in these moments of reform, what actually starts to happen is the same people that created these unjust systems like the money bail system, they're still in power and they are the ones who are determining what replaces that system. So just to give you an example in the money bail system, there was a movement 40 years ago, 50 years ago, um, to get rid of the cash bail system in federal courts all over the country. It was led by very fancy people, a lot of white male privileged lawyers and judges, and they decided it was unjust to keep someone in jail just because they couldn't pay. And they, they succeeded in passing a congressional bill in 1984, um, which ended what we call wealth-based detention pre-trial in federal courts. On the day that bill was passed, 24% of all federal um, uh, the criminal defendants were jailed just because they couldn't pay cash bond. It was a big, big problem. But today, as I'm speaking to you all, um, in federal courts all over this country, the rate of pretrial detention is now 72.4%. So we got rid of wealth-based detention, but we tripled actual pretrial detention. And the people that we're detaining are still overwhelmingly poor, disproportionately Black and Hispanic. So the reform actually resulted in a problem that was three times greater than what it was prior to the reform. And we're seeing that all over the country now in, for example, the cash bail system. Um, jurisdictions are getting rid of the use of cash bail, but they're increasing the use of detention based on, not on your access to money, but based on calling you dangerous or using some algorithm to predict whether you're dangerous in the future. Um, all of these are incredibly um, pervaded by racial disparities and, and almost everyone involved in, in the criminal punishment system in this country is very poor. And so um, you see this all across the criminal justice reform world. The types of reforms that are being offered are reforms that are not going to change the core architecture of how the system is functioning, but they're gonna shave off some of its most grotesque flourishes. So for example, one of the most popular reforms after Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson was um, giving police body cameras. Um, this was actually an idea that the police unions themselves had been having for years. They wanted several hundred million dollars for this new technology that would give them the power to surveil and record all of the interactions they were having. So in instead of talking about big questions like, why are the police in these neighborhoods in the first place? Why are they arresting almost exclusively black and brown and poor people for possessing plants that are on a list of plants they're not supposed to possess? Why are they stopping and frisking people and brutalizing people? Why are they there? Why are we having them? Why do we need them, right? Instead, we were asking questions about like, how many cameras can we get them to go into the same neighborhoods, to arrest the same people? We wanna film all of this as, as it's happening. So rather than asking questions about why it's happening in the first place. And I could go on and on about these types of reforms um, but I think the core point is that unless we build power in our communities to change who has power and who's creating these policies and these laws, the same interests that created all of these injustices are going to present us with new reforms that are putting a different label on the same thing. Um, let me just pause there for a moment um, and, and see if there's uh, some questions. Okay, I see some questions. Um, I'm just going to go one by one through them. Is that okay, Dustin? Yeah, that's totally okay. And I also have a couple more from the Google form that we have that uh, uh, some follow ups to what you've been saying. So uh, once you've gone through those, uh, okay. I can field those as well. Great. So um, the question, first question is, would abolishing capital punishment whitewash the carceral system? Um, so I think, you know, one of this, this is Kurt's question. I think um, certainly there's, there's an extent to which the death penalty and capital punishment for years 
sort of dominated a lot of conversations about reform. And a lot of people, you know, were obviously very concerned about the injustice of, of, of capital punishment. Um, but, you know, one of the main reforms to the capital punishment system was giving people life without parole, right? Um, which is really a death sentence in prison. Um, and, and, and so I think we have to be very, very careful about how we frame the, the struggle against the particular injustices in the criminal punishment bureaucracy, because um, make no mistake, I mean, the, the system is very happy to, to replace capital punishment with caging people for life without the possibility of parole. And that does nothing to get at the sort of core features of the system. You have to keep in mind, there are very few people on death row in this country. So 95% of all police arrests in this country are for things that the FBI says are not serious violent crimes. So the vast, vast bulk of what police are doing has nothing to do with the violent crime that they supposedly justify themselves using. And of the 5% that does involve serious violent crime, only a tiny sliver of it um, are, are, are first degree murders that could result in the death penalty. It's a, it's a, a very tiny um, slice of an entire bureaucracy that has the purpose of preserving the way that our society looks. And so um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of politicians that have tried to present themselves as real reformers because they, you know, oppose a death penalty, for example, when in fact they are at the forefront of, of constructing the rest of this, this giant bureaucracy, um, which is causing so much pain and inflicting so much brutality um, all over the country um, in, in impoverished communities. And so I, I do think we have to be very, very careful about focusing on individual pieces of reform in the same way that we can't be thinking about criminal justice reform as if it's some kind of a silo. Um, the criminal punishment bureaucracy looks the way that it looks precisely because it's an effort to prevent the rest of our society from becoming more equal. Um, the punishment bureaucracy would not look anything like it looks if we had safe, affordable places to live for everyone. If everyone had access to universal health care, we didn't have rampant poverty and inequality. The criminal punishment bureaucracy is, is the ruling class in our society, the people who own things. It's their way of dealing with very poor people, dealing with white supremacy, managing it, controlling the way our neighborhoods look. It's the, it's the way of doing that without actually changing those underlying structures. It's a way of controlling and surveilling and punishing and caging and keeping in their place all of the people who they don't want to let into a much more um, broader egalitarian um, society where all human beings can flourish. Look at the next question here. Obviously a world without police and prison is desirable and you do a good job of pointing out that rich white communities have effectively abolished the police. So what steps are required to make abolition materialize for all communities? I think this is a similar, this is a great question, Noah. Um, it's a similar point to the one I was just making. We have to organize. We will never accomplish anything unless we come together and build the kind of power, build relationships with each other in our communities, build power that can take on some of the really powerful entities in our society. Like for example, large corporations who make billions of dollars a year um, on the way our criminal punishment system is, is functioning and police unions. These are two of the most organized entities in our whole society. What I mean by organized there is they have, um, you know, thousands and thousands of people who, who at any given moment are all saying the same thing. They're marching for the same thing. They're demanding the same things. They're connected to each other in all kinds of ways. They, they advocate very pa passionately and, and, and persistently all across the country in every local city. The police unions have been winning every major budget battle in local jurisdictions. It's why um, two weeks ago, the day after he gave a eulogy at George Floyd's funeral in Houston, the mayor of Houston increased the police budget by $20 million the very next day. Why? Because the police union is organized. They're powerful. Every politician in that city knows that the police union has a block of votes and, and a lot of money. They will put into their, into their elections. They will, they will use their platforms on social media. Um, we need to build our own um, powerful systems. We need to re-energize organized labor, nurses, teachers, social workers. We need in our own communities to develop um, connections with each other and come together in organized, you know, whether that's, um, you know, community groups, whether it's, it's organizers, um, whether, it's, whether it's churches, 
um, we need to come together in ways that allow us to not just be individual voices, but to be speaking in unison together. And then secondly, Noah, I think it's absolutely vital that this fight isn't about narrow issues like what policies should police have for use of force, whether we should have body cameras for police, you know, um, uh, what, what um, like types of crimes should police be charging? These are all like interesting questions that, that are fine on the margins, right? But we need to be having much deeper conversations about why is our society so unequal? How is white supremacy manifesting in the distribution of housing in our society? Why do our neighborhoods look like they look? Um, why are people, some people hoarding so much wealth in our society? Why don't people have safe places to live? Um, why are people unable to access healthcare, mental health treatment? Um, what are the causes of things like drug addiction, right? Um, how can we invest in the things that communities need to flourish? These are big public health um, issues that involve all of these systems that relate to each other, immigration, education in our schools, housing. And we can't have this abolitionist conversation at all unless we're willing to confront um, the, the, all of the other systems that impact the criminal system. Okay. Um, so the current goal of the system is unquestionably, this is a question from an anonymous person. So the current goal of the system is unquestionably bankrupt. Um, oops, the question disappeared. Um, yeah, something weird's going on with the Q&A thing. Um, I'm sorry, anonymous. Um, I'm just going to read. Uh, 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 I'll just go through other questions. I'm sorry. Another anonymous person says, um, how, how has the money bill system persisted despite the conceptual legal abolition of debtor's prison? So this is a really great question. Um, what you have to understand about our legal system, first and foremost, is that the way that it's lived and experienced by people on the ground, particularly poor people and people of color, is very different from the way that it's written in our law books. The gap between the way the law is lived and the way the law is experienced is enormous. So debtor's prisons have been illegal um, for decades in this country. And yet, um, every single courtroom that I went to and that I investigated for years was operating a debtor's prison all over the country. People were just being jailed if they couldn't pay. Um, same thing with the money bail system. Now you ask, why does it persist? I think in the money bail system, um, there are really two particular reasons. Um, the broader point about why all these injustices persist in the legal system is that the actual goals and functions of our criminal system have nothing to do with what they say their goals are. They say their goals are public safety, right? And preserving order. Um, that is not the, the actual function of the criminal punishment bureaucracy. The criminal punishment bureaucracy's actual function, as I describe in the book, and as Michelle Alexander writes in her book, The New Jim Crow, as Angela Davis talks about in her brilliant book, which you should all read called Are Prisons Obsolete? The actual function of that system is to control certain people in our society, to keep them in their place, um, to preserve white supremacy, to protect the property of people who own property, even if that property was stolen from indigenous and black people over the course of several hundred years. Um, but on the money bail system in particular, it evolved to serve, I think, two main functions. Um, the first function is profit. So um, the rise, the, the for-profit commercial money bail industry in this country is a multi-billion dollar a year business. It exists only in the United States and the Philippines. And this, this for-profit money bail system makes a ton of money, right? In Los Angeles, police department arrests alone. So just one police department, not even LA County, just the city of Los Angeles Police Department over a five-year period that UCLA just studied, the commercial bond companies extracted $192 million in wealth from families in Los Angeles who were too poor to pay the full amount of the cash bond. Tremendously profitable. Um, in Maryland, over the same five-year period, it was $75 million, right? So these companies have a tremendous interest. And so what do they do? They donate to political campaigns. They write legislation. They donate to judicial campaigns to bring in local judges who are going to set higher and higher amounts of money bond. In New Orleans, we just won a lawsuit striking down the cash flow system in New Orleans. But for 25 years prior to our lawsuit, whenever you got into court to have, a, to have your pretrial release or detention decided, um, and the judge wanted to set a money bond, the judge, the sheriff who walked into the room, the prosecutor arguing against you, and even your own defense lawyer, they all took a percentage cut of whatever money bond the judge set. So everyone in the courtroom, other than you, um, had a financial incentive in setting a money bond. The second, um, I think, real function other than profit 
is that everybody understands that, that no court system could possibly process as many bodies as our court system is processing. No society in recorded modern history has ever tried. So although we have all of these beautiful constitutional rights, like the constitutional right to a jury trial, everyone in the legal system understands that when you arrest 11 million people every single year, you can't possibly have that many jury trials. We don't have enough lawyers, we don't have enough jurors, we don't have enough prosecutors, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough judges, we don't have enough courtrooms. So what does the system do? It devises ways of coercing you into pleading guilty. And this is why in many jurisdictions, 96 to 98 percent of all people are waiving, they're giving up their right to a jury trial, and they're pleading guilty. And they're coerced into pleading guilty because they're told, um, unless you plead guilty right now, we're going to put you in a cage for even longer. And the quickest best way to coerce someone to pleading guilty is to have them be in a jail cell while they're making that decision, away from their job, away from their family, away from their house. And so what we proved in, for example, the Houston case in federal court was that for people that were too poor to afford to pay money bond, they pled guilty 84% of the time within a median of three days, right? They were, they were, they were immediately coerced into pleading guilty, and then they were let out with a fine or a fee so that the system could generate money off of them. But for people that could afford to pay to get released, they were more likely than not, 51%, to never get convicted of anything at all. So imagine um, with tens of thousands of people in the system, um, all of the extra work that would go into trials and discovery and legal hearings for months and months and months, because the people whose cases didn't plead guilty within three days, they lasted an average of four months, right? So... I think that the second answer to your question of why is the money bail system persisted is the money bail system is the way that our legal system all over the country coerces millions of quick guilty pleas so that the system can churn like an assembly line that it is. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, this is the anonymous question I was gonna read earlier. Though the current goal of the system is unquestionably bankrupt, do you think there are examples of instances where the punishment is necessary and justified? If so, how does a a world of prison abolition deal with those instances? This is a really great question. Um, let me first say that before we even answer a question like, is something like the current punishment system ever justified in any instances? Let me just say that the vast majority of the system has nothing to do with those types of instances at all. Um, we could get rid of 95% of what the police are doing and never get to that serious violent crime that, that I think really is the core of your question. And what's so disingenuous about most of the politicians now who are opposing calls to defund the police is that everyone who knows about these issues understands that almost none of what the police do is responsive to serious violent crime. The New York Times published a study the other day of most of the major police departments in the country and found that they spend less than 4% of their time on serious violent crime. Um, so let me, I want to just preface, I, I want to get to your question, but I just want to preface it by saying that the vast bulk of everything that's happening in the criminal punishment system has nothing to do with those instances. My own personal view, since you have it, and you need not agree with my, my view, is that the kind of punishment that we are inflicting in the current criminal system doesn't have any positive effects for anyone. There's no evidence that it leads to a society where that bad act um, will occur less. So for example, if you're concerned about um, sexual assault in our society, there's no evidence that paging someone who commits an act of, of gender-based violence or sexual assault um, or armed robbery or murder. There's no evidence that caging that person in conditions where they're likely to be further traumatized um, and brutalized has, has any effect on the level of that uh, activity occurring in society. To the contrary, there's great evidence that working systemically on things like toxic masculinity, poverty, um, deprivation, alienation, drug addiction treatment, trauma, um, sort of confronting people's trauma in, in non-carceral ways. Those are the things that there's a lot of evidence for that can reduce the instances of violence against people in our society. So I think that um, the punishment bureaucracy wants you to think that we need it to protect you, to make us safe. But, but how I was, I was debating the chief of police in Houston the other day on a podcast, and he made a similar point. And he said, um, we have the most violent society in the world. And you're telling me we don't need police and prisons and jails to, to put people away who are committing violence. And I said to him, you have a $1 billion budget just for your own little police force um, in the city of Houston, which doesn't even count the other 60 police forces in Harris County. 
or the $561 million budget for the Harris County Sheriff's Office. You've been spending that billion dollars for decades. We've spent trillions of dollars on the war on drugs, trillions of dollars on mass incarceration, on handcuffs, on tasers, on assault weapons, on tanks, on surveillance, and we still have the most violent society in the world? What kind of evidence does that say about the approach that you've chosen for 40 years? We've, we've, we've destroyed communities. We've separated tens of millions of children from their parents. We've um, carpet bombed Latin America with pesticides to supposedly get rid of, of the supply of, of drugs into our streets. Um, we've jailed um, 37 million people for marijuana possession alone. We've, um, you know, uh, we've put, we've made policing the biggest expenditure in most local budgets. And we still have the most violent society in the world. Maybe that should tell you something about the origin of violence. Um, keep in mind, for example, that police, when they, when they use the term violent, they're not talking about structural violence of poverty or foreclosing on people's homes, both of which kill way more people than all violent crime combined in this country. They're not talking about secondhand cigarette smoke, which kills 50,000 people every single year, dwarfing the number of people killed by all illegal drug use combined. They're not talking about lead poisoning in children's water. They're not talking about air pollution that kills more Americans every single year and all crime and violence combined. They're talking about a very specific propagandized uh, version of violence, which is a violence that, that serves um, people who own property in our society. Um, so anyway, I think that's, that's a sort of a long rambling way of trying to answer your question, which is I actually do not think we need anything that remotely resembles what our punishment system looks like currently to have safer communities that hold each other accountable, yes, um, but that don't involve a kind of brutality and punishment and, and racist um, bureaucracy that we have now. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to another question. Um, considering that carcerality seems to be a problem which extends beyond the supposed limits of the criminal justice system, like with the punishment bureaucracy of racist classism, how do you think we can extend abolitionist pedagogy beyond the formal legal system of criminal justice? How can people in academic spheres build power for a broader resistance movement against that bureaucracy? Another amazing question. These are all incredible questions. I think it comes down to um, um, several things. You know, one, linking all of these systems together. It's amazing now that people are, are their, their attention is being drawn to police brutality against black people uh, in a way that has never been, you know, before. But it's not enough to just go into the streets and demand that that some cop be prosecuted, or demand that we um, get body cameras for the police, or to demand even that we reduce the police funding. Um, we need to link. Why is it that our society uh, is the kind of society where um, we have tolerated and rationalized and justified and even treated as heroes? those people that are doing that activity um, for decades, right? How is that connected to the fact that in most major American cities, there are more vacant luxury apartments than there are people who don't have a home? How is that connected to the fact that, that we are one of the only um, countries in the world um, at this le comparable level of wealth where people can't get basic medical treatment? Um, and once you start asking some of those deep questions, I think we can forge alliances between all of the people who are thinking and theorizing and organizing and struggling in these different domains, the people that are fighting to ask questions like, why do we have borders? Why does it make sense to treat um, someone's life differently because they were born on this side of an imaginary political boundary? Um, why are our schools um, teaching people to memorize tests um, surrounded by armed guards and police officers? Why are they not teaching us to, to think critically? Um, why are we disciplining children in schools rather than than having them self-direct their education in a radical way. Um, these are all sort of pedagogical concepts that are connected to each other. Um, and once I think we, we have a movement that's, that's noticing the most overt, like sort of um, uh, manifestation of state control and violence and propaganda, the police, I think it opens up all of our hearts and minds to identify all of the ways in which in all of these other systems, these same powers that be are controlling our lives, whether it's the student debt, um, you know, uh, uh, system, which which is trapping um, whole generations of young people in in this sort of capitalist um, debt um, cycle. Um, whether it's I haven't talked at all yet about our foreign policy, but 
how is what's going on with the police right now in this country and the history of this country's um, um, sort of imperialism connected to the fact that we have a world where over 3 billion people are starving? Um, how is that connected to the environmental justice movements that are happening? And these are the kinds of things that our generation has entirely failed at, that I'm really hopeful that your generation can link all of this together and, and form alliances between the environmental justice um, movement, between the, the organized, uh, what I will hope will be an, a resurgent organized labor movement in this country, um, to come up with, with ideas and concepts like worker-owned co-ops and, and other things that can end um, community land trusts and ways that we can take back and democratize our workplaces, democratize our communities in a way that that um, the the last couple of generations have have really failed. Uh, okay. Uh, next question. A lot of amazing questions here, Dustin. This is an incredible group. Uh, yeah, these kids are brilliant. I'm I'm worried that I'm not doing them justice, but um, I'm trying my best. Um, doing great. All the reforms like end of cash bail would prevent those attempts. Um, of power building to effectively fight the criminal injustice system. This is another anonymous question, amazing question. This is a, a central uh, discussion that, that keeps me up every single night that we have with organizers all over the country. And that is um, before you support any reform, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how small or big, you have to have a theory for how that reform is building power. It's a snowball getting bigger and bigger as it rolls down the mountain and not cutting off other reforms um, you know, before they have a chance to really grow. And so that means that like any kind of reform that you, that you try to initiate has to be connected to a movement, to a campaign. If you, you know, fancy lawyers can't just go around saying, well, I think it'd be better if we tweaked this policy or this rule, right? You have to be part of a, a movement that has a theory for how each, each victory that it's winning is further building power. And so, yes, to answer your question, I have enormous fears about the ways in which bail reform has been co-opted by um, people who don't share our agenda of liberation, who don't share our agenda of power building, but who precisely want to um, create a facade of justice so that the energy around this reform movement will dissipate. And, and that is one of my greatest fears. And the only way to do that well is to build deep relationships with the people who are most directly impacted by these systems, with the people that are organizing a bit against them in city after city after city, and, and talking to them about what kinds of re reforms, incremental or, or, or larger reforms, are actually consistent with their strategy for how they're building a movement. And, and that's something that I think most lawyers are failing at um, tremendously because it's you're taught in law school. Lawyers are taught that they know best, that they understand the legal system, that they should be the leaders what that ends up doing often is creating um, elite-led legal reform movements um, that end up um, sort of uh, preserving this, this veneer of legitimacy for a system that is, is saying things about what it's doing on its marble monuments and in its, in its legal opinions um, that are very different from what it's actually doing to, to people's bodies and minds every single day. Okay, next question. When you say that we must organize, what are strategies for building an organized group movement in ways that involve or bring in those with resources and power so that the organized group can succeed? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not myself an organizer and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm like many of you probably learning as we go over the last few years. Um, so I'm not you know, in the best position to answer that question, but um, in working with some of the most brilliant organizers um, all over the country, I think you know, the, the key strategy um, for building that movement is, um, you know, you need on-ramps for people to get involved, to get educated, to feel invested. And so, for example, some of the, the, the most interesting things that we've been helping with are community bail funds around the country, our court watching programs. These are ways of exposing ordinary people to injustices and in an, a way that, that is emotional, it's vivid, it's, it's profound. And just going in and watching what our system is doing to people and their families and their bodies in our names has been a radicalizing experience. Um, there's one group in particular that we work with a lot called Silicon Valley Debug, which invented this model called participatory defense. And this model is basically um, when your loved one is charged with a crime, you come into the, to the participatory defense hub and you work with people on your loved one's case. Maybe you help prepare a, 
a little social bio packet that can be used at their bail hearing or to mitigate at sentencing or to help find witnesses in the community. And then in that process, you meet all of the other families whose loved ones are going through the system. And what, what, what used to be a, a scary, um, you know, frightening experience still with legalistic terms that you don't understand and a process you, you can't sort of figure out because it's so, you know, labyrinthine. Um, now you've got people who are you're in solidarity with, you're building relationships with, who are explaining it to you as you, as you go because they just went through it with their family. And pretty soon you've created a whole network of families in the community. And the next step that Debug is undertaking is instead of having a bureaucracy that the government controls um, to monitor people pre-trial or on probation with drug testing and electronic monitoring and e-carceration, now they have a group of families that can come into the court and say, don't jail this person. Don't put them on some kind of GPS ankle bracelet that they have to pay for. We will hold them in our community. We are creating an alternative mutual aid system that can replace the coercive bureaucracy of the state with something that the community actually has buy-in for. We can hold them accountable ourselves and we don't need guns or weapons or tasers. I say all of that, um, you know, there's a role for all of us to play. People like me can help lift up um, mutual aid, organizing like that, um, bail funds where people are coming together to bail out their people in their own community all over the country. We can lift that work up as examples. Um, we can um, draw some national resource. People like me who, who you know, have a lot of wealthy people asking them, how can we donate? How can we help? I can steer them to the best organizing that is happening around the country and they can, they can support that work. Um, there's no one answer to your question, but I think it's, it's the, the, the key is all of us in our local communities, um, figuring out what's going on, figuring out who is doing the most radical organizing that's challenging the very structures of our system, introducing yourself to them, getting involved, participating in actions they're doing, helping their, their mutual aid networks grow. I think that's really how this is all going to profoundly change for the better. Um, okay, uh, sorry, I'm losing track of all these questions. <clears throat> Um, what's the name of the podcast you were on where you debated the chief of police? That podcast was a podcast by a, a woman named Laura Arnold. So if you just Google my name and Laura Arnold podcast, you can find it. I also did um, a really great podcast on some of these issues for Current Affairs, which is a great um, leftist magazine that I think um, you might be interested in. And so you could Google my name and the Current Affair po Affairs podcast, and we get into depth on some of these issues as well. And then if you're interested in, in just the bail system in particular, I did a podcast um, with Clint Smith and Josie Duffy Rice called Justice in America. It was the first episode of their podcast where we just described how the money bill system in this country works in great detail. Um, okay. Um, what is the role of the federal government in abolition of police or prisons? What about branches of government or the constitution? Okay. Um, so the federal government plays a relatively small role in the construction of the punishment bureaucracy. Um, it certainly has a very powerful symbolic role. You know, when, when Nixon started discussing and talking about the war on crime and the war on drugs, that had an incredible effect um, sort of rhetorically on the political climate that then led a lot of state and local governments to, to embark on, on that 40-year catastrophe. But I think it's very, very important to understand that um, this has been a bipartisan issue. It's mostly throughout the country been constructed by Democrat politicians who run major local governments. So the Democrats who ran the Chicago machine, the Los Angeles machine, Houston, Dallas, New York City, um, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Columbus, you know, Cincinnati, all of these cities, Detroit, um, these are cities that have been run by Democrats. And Democrats created the policing and punishment bureaucracy at a very local level. The federal government played an important role on many different occasions. Um, the federal government itself, um, right, keeps over several hundred thousand people in, in cages, and the vast majority of which are for things that are, are nonviolent uh, offenses, um, to the extent that's a distinction that makes any, any sense to you or that matters. Um, I critique that notion in the book. Um, but, you know, the, over half of people in federal prison are there for a drug offense. And so the federal government's war on drugs itself um, ballooned the, the, the prison and jail population significantly. But the, the, the more important role the federal government played is in incentivizing bad policies at the state and local level. So for many, many decades, the federal government has had these grant programs where it funneled billions of dollars um, to local police forces, not just the tanks and the military weaponry and the surveillance systems, um, which is significant and, and horrifying when you actually um, 
uh, have any even remote understanding of the extent to which all of the technology that military industrial contractors develop for use um, against um, you know, people by and large Muslims in the Middle East um, in, in surveillance of in increasingly in, 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 in Africa and in, in Palestine. But like that technology that the military industrial complex and private corporations develop is now uh, flooded American police departments um, to the point where, um, where many local police departments go to Israel for training um, of their police officers and how to conduct SWAT team raids and, and what they call counterterrorism. Um, the companies that develop the devices that, that mimic your cell phone and steal all the data um, are now selling those to all local police departments. Um, Palantir, a very large big data company, which was a, one of the, the main um, companies that the CIA's venture capital firm, and many, many of you probably didn't know the CIA has its own venture capital firm that invests in, in uh, military industrial complex companies. Um, Palantir and Amazon now have contracts with many local police departments all over the country um, to process ever growing numbers of uh, pieces of data and, and, and they're putting into all these sort of machine learning algorithms that are supposedly predicting where crime is going to occur. Um, they're using facial recognition software, I can go on and on. Um, the federal government has had a major role in seeding all of that technology. But in addition to all of that, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, it spent billions and billions of dollars um, on just grants to local police departments all over the country to hire new officers, to develop partnerships with the DEA and the ATF, um, to develop joint task forces. Um, and this funded, you know, President Clinton famously, had, you know, um, gave federal funding for 100,000 new police officers. Imagine the pain and brutality that caused. Imagine how many families were separated by the arrest that those 100,000 police officers then made. Um, Biden then wanted to, to add 50,000 more police officers later in the 1990s. Um, so the federal government paid for a lot of this as well, um, but it was, a, it was really led by people on the local and state level. Um, okay. Um, Next question was, do you think that the majority of police violence stems from how they are taught to police? Anyone can be evil, always ready to fight back against aggressors. Or do you think that, um, where did that question go? It just moved up right to the top of the Q and A um, thing. We think the system comes down to cognitive biases that we can't really alter. I think there are a few things going on. I think um, there are several really important aspects of, of what's causing police violence. Number one is that it's, it's taking place in a society um, where, where racism is deeply entrenched. Um, our society just does not value um, uh, black life. And that you know, profound, deeply structural, historical um, feature of our society um, is the sort of the predicate on which a lot of this police violence is, is based. Um, moreover, this you know, tremendous lack of, of sensitization to poverty and mental illness. Um, and I think like th there, this, this view that certain people's lives just don't matter and are expendable is a sort of a core malignancy of uh, American policing. Another is the culture of police, certainly. Um, as you've seen probably from reading the Stanford Prison Experiments, uh, which I, I'm guessing you've read based on your, your question, um, when you get into to, to groups like this, you can develop a culture that, is, um, uh, that can lead to horrific atrocities happening um, that any one individual person, you know, wouldn't have done without being a part of that group. Um, third, I think there's, the police are, are given weaponry in our society. There are many countries where police don't have weapons. Um, and I think a lot of police violence is predicated not just on the culture of fear and the devaluation of life and, and this group think mentality that, that makes them think that they are warriors under siege, right, fighting a battle against their own communities, um, but it's that they, they have all of those, those biases in the, in the context of, a, of, of handling weapons. Um, and when you put weapons in the context of someone who has been taught to be afraid, who's been taught that life doesn't matter, and who's been taught that they are a hero, um, that it's infallible, who are existing in a culture of complete unaccountability. So when you add the fact that like nothing bad ever happens to the police who brutalize people every single day, um, you have a recipe for disaster. I think all of those things um, moreover, um, we have to understand that um, people who own things in our society have used the police to invoke um, uh, the force and violence of the state. And so when you ask me about police violence, 
Um, I imagine you're thinking about things like the death of George Floyd, but I think of it as violent um, for the police to put metal chains on someone for possessing the marijuana plant and to separate them from their children for, um, you know, selling cocaine um, for years, right? Um, uh, this, this, this forcible separation of families is another type of violence that isn't viewed as, as the same, but that is the type of violence that good cops are doing every single day all over the country, right? Um, it's good cops that are enforcing the cash bail system. It's good cops that are arresting people for trespassing when they have nowhere else to live. It's good cops that are, that are chaining people's bodies and they bring them into courtrooms. It's good cops that are guarding their jail cells at night. It's good cops that are enforcing rules that you can no longer visit with your children when you're jailed, right? Um, so that's the everyday violence that everybody, um, probation officers, public defenders, prosecutors, judges, police, we're all desensitized to that. Everyone who works in the legal system is profoundly desensitized to that everyday violence. Um, and then in terms of the more overt, sort of more stigmatized violence that you're talking about, I think the reasons that I, that I gave earlier are some, some of the reasons that, that police are engaging in it. Um, okay, next question. Do you think that the notion of criminalization, especially poor black, brown communities can and will be dismantled in the world without prisons? How will that happen considering it's so ingrained in society and history? Um, great question. Um, so, you know, when a lot of people ask about abolition, they, they, they're very confused. And it, it, we've come a long way in just the last month, but for years when I would talk about abolition, people would say, well, how can you be an abolitionist? How can, how, how is it possible? All these, these, these views are so ingrained. We have so many, um, so much harm that's caused in our society. I think the, the abolitionist response to that is, Abolition is only hard to imagine if you imagine our world that looks exactly like it looks now, but just removing all the police stations and prisons and jails. Of course, that seems kind of absurd because our society is causing so much trauma and so much pain and so much alienation um, that, that people hurt other people. And there needs to be some mechanism for holding those people accountable and preventing that harm. But abolitionists would say, if we had a radically different society um, that was truly tackling um, the lack of connection between human beings and some of the, these biases that you talk about, we wouldn't need any of these systems at all. And the ways that we'd hold each other accountable would look very different. And so I think, I do think that's possible. And I think um, one of the things that's so exciting about these mutual aid networks that are developing all over the country and city after city is people are building the kinds of relationships with each other that not only lead to less harm, people harming each other, and, and less de desperation and, and despair, but that also are the kinds of networks that can then hold each other accountable when someone does commit harm. And if we ingrain that, um, I, I think we have a chance of abolishing some of these systems. Um, okay, many of the strategies you outlined, such as designing curriculum and community initiatives that counter toxic masculinity would go a long way in preventing violence. How can we create accountability for violence that has already occurred in a post-abolition society, especially in cases where victims can't really be fully reinstated to the harm done. This is a really amazing question. Instead of answering it myself, I'm just going to direct you to a couple of amazing people that have written and, and thought about this a lot. Miriam Kaba, K-A-D-A, um, has written a lot about transformative justice and exactly the questions that you're talking about. Um, Critical Resistance, which is an amazing organization started by Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Angela Davis and others, um, has written a lot about how we hold people accountable for committing acts of violence in an abolitionist world. Um, there's a, a recent book by Danielle Sered, S-E-R-E-D, called Until We Reckon, which talks about the work that her nonprofit organization in Brooklyn has been doing um, with violent, um, with restorative justice work with violent offenses. And then there's an amazing person called uh, Sujatha Baliga, B-A-L-I-G-A, who has really been one of the pioneers of the restorative justice movement working out of Oakland, California um, for years. Fujatha is about to come out with a book as well, um, but, but just look at some of Fujatha's work and some of her writings, some of her, her, talk, her talks about this issue. And I think um, those uh, people can, can, can answer that question much more profoundly than I can and direct you to them. Um, okay, next question. How does the school to prison pipeline uh, change the ideology of schools specifically? Do you think that in order to fully abolish the criminal system, we have to change our education system? Yes. I think in some senses, um, these systems of oppression are very similar. Um, the type of rhetoric and discipline and discourse that you see coming from many of our school systems 
is very similar to the type of, of um, disempowering, um, dehumanizing um, mentalities that pervade our criminal system. And so certainly if we have any hope of changing these systems, um, we need to think of our education system not as a place where we reproduce good workers for the capitalist system. We teach them how to take a test and how to learn a math equation. We teach them the date on which some battle happened or, or um, the name of some famous person who supposedly did something. We need to confront much more profoundly um, how do we create people who are thinking and feeling people, who feel connected to other human beings? How do we um, create critical thinkers who understand how to take and process the information that they're getting? Um, and because all of us are living in a world that is constantly bombarded with propaganda. That is the main function of institutions like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Those are institutions that very much like the way that our society looks. And yeah, maybe they, ha they occasionally have a, a liberal, moderate Democrat valence, but they very much want to preserve the structure of our society. And so all of their reporting from the choices of what they cover and what they don't cover, what they say about it, what they don't say about it, all of this is propaganda. And we're all going to be influenced by that propaganda um, unless we develop incredible critical thinking skills and we develop a culture of connecting ourselves to other people who are holding us accountable and, and asking us hard questions and constantly pushing us on our own beliefs. And so that's what our school system should be. And there's no coincidence that many of the wealthiest people in our society are spending billions of dollars on education reform to try to prevent that kind of critical thinking, to try to promote um, you know, raising test scores as a way of measuring whether our education system is doing something. So I think it's a, a very vital um, question that, that you've raised and, and, a, and one of the most profoundly important fights that we can have um, in our society in terms of like, and that's why there's so much attention paid by, by wealthy people over what school boards are doing and what curriculum they have. I mean, if, if you're a, a teacher that, that's, that's having students read and engage with a people's history of the United States, that's a really different environment than someone who's teaching the sort of um, classic um, sort of white supremacist American history textbook. Um, you're gonna cultivate something really different in children's minds. And I think the people who own things and control our society are very scared about what will happen if children's minds are cultivated in that way. Um, okay, do you think the underlying systems of oppression you've highlighted in the criminal systems also exist in civil and immigration courts? Do you think there needs to be different ways to organize movements to answer the oppression in these other systems? Yes, um, the civil and immigration courts are uh, profoundly unjust in almost all the same ways as the criminal system. We have virtually no access to civil justice for poor people in this country. So if you're a poor person whose employer is stealing her wage, almost never can you get justice in the civil immigration courts. And in, in almost no civil proceeding are you entitled to a lawyer. Very, very difficult to navigate. Um, those courts are, are controlled by all the same elite interests that set our laws, that, that judge our cases, um, that get elected to these positions. Um, it's a profoundly unjust system. And it gets a lot less attention in the criminal system, frankly. And the immigration system is just an absolute nightmare. I mean, as you all know, you're not entitled to a lawyer in the immigration system either. Um, you may have seen some of those amazing videos and recordings of children as young as four or five years old trying, you know, in an immigration hearing without a lawyer. Um, the immigration system is designed um, to um, support this notion that human beings can and should be treated differently based on where they were born. And until we profoundly um, like decolonize our minds of this notion of borders, um, which I think of as very similar to a lot of the, the um, sort of aspects of our, our own domestic society, like delineating lines of property that I own and that you don't own and you can't come on and if you don't own it, right? Um, in a society that, that basically stole all of that land and property and then arbitrarily divvied it up to, to certain people who look a certain way. Um, these are all connected. And so the immigration system is deeply connected, not just because they're using the same military equipment and law enforcement apparatus um, and system of private and, and, and public jails, but because of the, the, the mindset in our minds that, that allows us to tolerate something like the concept of a border is very similar to the mindset that allows us to tolerate a concept like private ownership of property.
Um, okay. Um, oh my goodness. Dustin, I'm really um, losing track of all these amazing questions. Yeah, there is there okay. is a lot and you don't have to feel pressured to finish them all. Yeah, I'm just, I feel like I'm just, it's like a lightning round here. <laughs> I'll lose my voice. Okay, how would you recommend a new wave of socialist progressive politicians in Congress incorporate abolitionism into their political platform? That feels like a question that's beyond my pay grade. Um, I've been asked that question by some of those people in Congress and, and other people, and I actually, I, I don't have a good sense of, of how they can, how they can and should do that other than, um, you know, keeping to build their grassroots movement, right? Um, I would, you know, urge them, you know, it's fine to sort of play some of the political games in, in Washington, I guess, if, if, if on certain issues, especially if it involves keeping certain issues in, in the public discourse, but they can't lose sight of the fact that they're only as strong as the grassroots movement that is supporting them. And, and so I think most of their time and energy should be spent trying to build and support that movement, nourish it, um, and, and help it, help it grow. Because, you know, it's great to have a few people in Congress who are identifying themselves as, as socialists, but um, we need, we need the majority of people in Congress to, to identify themselves with, with principles like those. Um, and so if we're going to dramatically transform our society. And so um, to me, it's about figuring out ways that they can support a mass movement um, and be accountable to it rather than, than tricky ways they can use some of their own current position to, to, to wield their, the, what little power they currently have. Um, if you don't mind, I want to jump in with a question from the uh, Google Forms thing. You've covered most of them, but there's uh, just one that uh, I'd like to touch on if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so with regards to the, you know, some of the more practical logistics of abolition, uh, what should happen to, you know, the criminals, especially people who are in prison for, you know, uh, more violent offenses? What potential solutions, you know, to like what, what, what should happen to them, uh, you know, if in a world without prisons? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> again, like, I happen to be the person that's sitting here in front of you, but I, I, I'm not the person most qualified to answer that question. There are people who've done incredible work on this in the country. Um, one, one resource that I think is very helpful in thinking through this question is a, a short free documentary you can watch on CNN um, that features my friend Richie. It's called The Feminist on Cell Block Y. Again, it's called The Feminist on Cell Block Y. Um, and it's about, um, uh, a program that Richie created when he was in prison and for years. And it's a program to um, create study groups of radical feminist texts um, with people in prison who've been accused of serious violent crime um, on, on the theory that most violence in our society is the result of, in, in some way, shape or fashion of toxic masculinity. And um, it's a, it's a, program that, that um, seeks to sort of you know, disentangle um, toxic masculinity in people's minds. And it's really profoundly, I don't want to say too much more about it because it's a profoundly beautiful short documentary. It's only about 30 or 40 minutes, and, um, uh, if I recall. And um, the idea is that once those circles happen and happen for months, it, you know, and it took Richie years of organizing in the prisons to even create a safe space to do that. Um, now that Richie is out, um, someone else then runs that program the next year, and then someone who goes through that program then runs another version of it. And now um, the, when people get out of prison, Richie hires them to set up those programs in other places, whether it's juvenile detention caging facilities or other prisons or jails or even um, you know, schools, right, to, to start this curriculum. Um, and I think that's just one small window into the fact that like much of violent crime that occurs in our society is not natural. It's not the kind of thing that needs to occur. In close relationships, um, scrutiny of some of the pathologies that lead to violence in our society um, can actually remedy a lot of that and create the kinds of relationships and bonds that, that, that make that, that crime non-existent. And then, of course, um, for the situations where it, and of course, I obviously, like, uh, it's not just about toxic masculinity. It's about poverty. It's about um, trauma. It's about hmm, cycles of trauma. Um, so there's lots of other structural things that we can do to reduce the instances of violent crime. Um, but like, yes, there will be times when people hurt other people. And 
many other societies in world history have dealt with that in different ways. Um, our society used to deal with it differently. Um, we used to inflict other forms of punishment um, rather than caging someone for years, right? Um, I think it, it's, it's, that's the kind of question that the restorative and transformative justice movement is really grappling with. And um, there might be ways that people come up with um, that, uh, uh, you know, I might disagree with, but, but that involve um, sequestering people um, from other people for a period of time. It doesn't look anything like what our current jails and prisons look like, but that would accomplish some of the goals of, of, of until we're on that, in that place where, where society is so healthy that it's not creating really any of this conduct, that might be a way of, of keeping people apart from each other who need to be kept apart from each other. But um, there's a whole literature on this, and I, the restorative justice books and people that I mentioned earlier have been, have been writing about the question that you just asked, Dustin, for a long time. Thank you. We can go back to the Zoom Q&A now. Um, OK. Um, how can a white person living in support of abolition be an effective member of the abolition movement aside from being a model of what all society should look like? Doesn't it create problems on the level of the person still benefiting from the oppression that exists in society, even if it's by fighting it? Yeah, I mean, uh, the answer to that question might look different in different communities um, with different histories and different movements and different strategies. And so um, I think, you know, the first thing for white people to do is to, under, to, to learn as much as possible about this history and about how these systems are functioning um, and to be aware of it. And that's no small thing. And then the second thing is like, follow the leadership and guidance of the people who are organizing in your community who are directly impacted by these systems, who are leading these abolitionist movements, um, who, who are, who are um, able to tell you how a white person can help their movement and what their organizing work um, be most effective. And like their answer might be different and different people might need to do different things in different places. Um, and then there are white people that might need to organize other white people who are more moderate and more conservative. And there might be a role for you in liaising with some of those communities and using some of your wealth and property and privilege and, and whiteness in, in ways that, that are in service of, of very particular tactics and strategies. So there are all kinds of ways to, and it's important that you don't feel guilty or stifled by, by the fact that you're benefiting from, from the way that our society looks. Um, and it's important that, that we feel empowered to not just stand by and do nothing, but to ask how we can be in service of, of the movement. Um, okay, would it be better for a state and local reform rather than top-down bills from Congress? Do you think Supreme Court precedent is one of the few reasons for the federal government to act rather than having state policy change? Um, I think that like the, the fact of the matter is in our current political environment, Congress is so thoroughly captured by the wealthy corporate elite that the possibility of something good coming from Congress is very slim. And the same is has been largely true of local and state legislatures, but I think it's easier for um, local grassroots movements to affect local change. And I think um, happily, um, if we build a lot of these local movements and we actually build real power in all these places, that will then filter up automatically to Congress eventually. I think it's always a mistake to try to start from the top down, whereas because nothing good is gonna come from the top unless there's a wide base that's entirely organized, that's demanding it from the bottom. And so from my perspective, um, starting with, a, with, with, with you know, really committed and really, really um, uh, persistent, radical local organizing is always gonna be the solution. Um, okay, I think a lot of what's going on with the criminal system in the US, mass incarceration, blah, 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 is tied to capitalism and the drive for profit. Given that these industries wield so much political power, the prison industrial complex, do you think reform is possible or is abolition necessary? Also, is there a possibility that corporations are being shut down, that corporations are able to shut down our grassroots movement? Very, very important question. Um, not only is there a giant prison industrial complex, billions of dollars, people don't, you know, people hear a lot about the for-profit prisons, for example, but most people don't understand that every single public jail and prison in this country has privatized virtually every aspect of what goes on inside the jail. Phone calls, doctor's visits, food, commissary, um, labor for profit. So um, you're forced to labor for several cents an hour um, in many of these places for the benefit of large corporations on the outside. So it's not just private prisons, it's an entire ecosystem. It's the people that make the tasers and the handcuffs, the people that make 
all of the new software programs that every police department is using. Um, it's, it's the people that, that um, are probation officers and parole officers and prosecutors and judges. I mean, it, it's not just the profit motive of large corporations, and that's important, but it's also the extent to which um, such a large percentage of our economy and society is depending on this massive bureaucracy to make money, um, to make their salaries. And so all of those people in those corporations have a very strong interest in, in so just to give you an example, um, several years ago, the multi-billion dollar prison phone industry this <clears throat> realized that there was a very big market to be made on video calling for people in, in jails and prisons. What did they do? They bribed thousands of jails and prisons around the country to eliminate um, in-person visits for family members and to tell people if they wanted to see their family members, they had to pay for video call. And so the, the person who owns the largest of these companies, Securus, is also the billionaire who owns the Detroit Pistons. And these people are, have a profound influence on our society, and they are profiting off of the separation of black families. And not only that, but local sheriffs all over the country, the sheriff in probably every single one of the places that you guys are calling in from today um, has a contract with those companies, um, Global Tel Link or Securus, to monetize and profit off of the desire of mostly poor families to communicate with each other when they're in cages. And those people are not going to go quietly into the night. They have billions of dollars invested in this system, and um, they have a profound interest in co-opting the protests, in convincing people that minor tweaks are necessary and not big changes, in depicting um, abolition as some kind of radical fringe scary position rather than as the natural consequence of a system that is causing enormous pain with no benefit. Um, so yes, I, I am very worried about that. Um, okay, um, another question. I've always wanted to be some form of defender or lawyer within the criminal system. How, would, um, how could one be a part of the system while changing and restructuring at the same time? So this is a, a question that I struggle to answer every day. I don't have a, a great answer because in, in some, some degree, you know, the, even the cases that we're a part of, even though we partner with, with organizing and try to think of ourselves as, as contributing in some way to a movement, to some extent, being a public defender or civil rights lawyer and invoking our constitution and our laws and our legal system is legitimating that system at the very same time. And so it's a fine line to walk. I think one thing that's been exciting for me recently with respect to public defenders is that um, they are beginning to think of their work not just as representing a single client. And, and now when I was a public defender, we were forbidden from talking to the media, for example. And so for years, the media narrative, we ceded it to the police and to prosecutors, and people were not getting an accurate understanding of what was happening in the criminal system. And now there's a growing movement of public defenders to tell their clients stories, to work with their clients and organizers and journalists and artists and musicians. Um, we, for example, have an artist in residence and a poet in residence at our organization who are both formerly incarcerated, um, who are helping us tell these stories in a much different way to different audiences in ways that, that legal documents and paperwork can't. And so I do think there is a way, if you do it right, I hope, um, to participate on, in the system in a way that undermines and subverts it. And um, maybe I'm wrong about that. And I'm, I, I, I keep struggling with that. And there are days I think that that's harder than than, than, I, than I can bear. But, um, but I, I think it's something for you to keep thinking about as you, as you, you know, get closer and closer to your career. Um, do you think that movements need to have a central justification or moral theory? If so, what should that, um, what theory should that be to make movements successful? No, I mean, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, movements can mean something slightly different to everyone who's participating in them. But I, I do think they need a central set of principles that everyone sort of buys into. So, you know, like this current movement, I think at its core, it needs to have a, a central set of principles that like black life matters, right? And, and that um, um, it's vital that every human being be given a chance to live a flourishing life. Those are some really basic concepts that I think people are coalescing around. And without that sort of central principle, doesn't mean everyone needs to agree on every little little facet of it, but without some kind of central core moral grounding, um, you wonder how deep the solidarity can really be. Um, okay, do you think there's any criminal justice reform 
that could actually be effective in diminishing the power and or violence of the punishment system. Yeah, so in the, in the book, I talk about some reforms that I think are actually, um, you know, in service of dismantling the system. And I think there are a number of them. Um, just to give a few examples, you know, um, in the bail reform context, um, you know, one good reform is to eliminate the possibility of using cash bail or pretrial detention for a wide swath of cases. So if you could say, for example, um, you're not even eligible to be detained pretrial or to be given cash bail in any of these 50 offenses, that would be shrinking the size of the system in a way that matters, that I think it's sort of a ratchet that can go down after that. And so I think reforms that actually decrease the size and scope of the system, so for example, um, decriminalizing and legalizing drug use, drug possession, drug sale, um, that would dramatically decrease the types of interactions police can have with us would dramatically decrease the number of people that are brought into our system of caging. It would then dramatically increase the amount of money that police, prosecutors, lawyers, private companies can make off of that system. And so reforms that actually do decrease the size of the bureaucracy are actually important. And that's why I think, you know, all over the country, you're seeing organizers fight to, to block the construction of new jails on the theory that if you build these things, we're going to fill them. But if you don't build them and you, and you limit the the room that we have to cage people, you're going to limit the number of people that are that are able to be caged. So I, I, you can look at the, at the book um, if, you, if you're interested in, in more examples, but I think that those are some that come to mind. Um, question, to what extent, if at all, do you learn about these issues in law school? Well, when I was in law school, you, you very much did not learn about these things. They're just not part of the curriculum. I think that's still probably the, the case, although most law schools now have some kind of curriculum that deals with this. And in the wake of this movement now, um, I'd be shocked if it didn't transform in some respects the way that, that legal teaching is conducted. But you have to understand that law schools hire a very particular type of person to teach there. And most of those people don't have anywhere near the kind of political views that I've been expressing to you here. Um, and they have very particular interests and, and um, very particular socioeconomic class and, and, and racial identity. And so, um, you know, there, there's a, a big fight to be fought in law school curriculums. Most of the fancy law schools around the country that are very wealthy are basically breeding grounds for corporate lawyers. The vast majority of people that go to those schools become corporate lawyers that make a lot of money. And until we understand the connection between that and the things that I've been talking about here today, I don't think we have much of a hope of, of really transforming our society. Um, do you think popular media can function as an effective form of propaganda that starts in early childhood with things like Paw Patrol and continues with shows like Brooklyn Nine Line? If it does, how can that kind of propaganda be overcome? Yes, I think that one of the major functions of popular media is to um, preserve, create, and then preserve certain myths about how our society works. And um, how it can be overcome is many, many new people using different and, and more accessible forms of media now to create different types of, of media. Um, helping people understand that propaganda so they can fortify their minds against it. Um, I'm very particular, for example, about what I read, what I watch, what I put into my mind, what music I listen to, what poetry I hear, right? So um, what art I consume. Um, we all, perhaps the one thing that we all have the most control over in our lives is how we curate our own mind, who we spend our time with, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read. Um, and if you take that, that seriously as a life goal and you spend five, six, seven, 10, 15 years curating your own mind, you can create a beautiful, critical, kind mind. Um, but if you just allow yourself to be subject to what our culture throws at you, you're going to see a lot of propaganda that's trying to justify a current society, which the people who are making that propaganda, they like the way the distribution of wealth looks in our society. They like that 3 billion people are starving around the world. That society is comfortable for them. And so um, this is maybe the most important thing I say today is that you have to devote yourself to curating your own mind. And that is something that um, is one of the most profound and most difficult lessons because some of the schools that you're going to go to are going to be devoted to, um, you know, taking away that sense of, of empowerment over your own mind and, and, and um, 
but you you have so much control by virtue of who you spend your time with and, and what you what you put into your mind. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay, with the current protest, do you think co-option has already started to happen? Do you think that the nature of the protest is more resistant to that? I think both those things are true. I think the current protests are more resistant. Um, because we've been here, we've done that, we've seen them the way they co-opted the protests after Ferguson. Um, and we've got a lot of organizing that happened led by, you know, um, the, the, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement over the last few years um, since Ferguson that has a much deeper, profound cultural effect and is able to withstand some of the co-optation. But, but no, make no mistake, I mean, every major politician is co-opting um, What's going on right now? The the major bills that are being proposed by the Democrats in Congress, the Congressional Black Caucuses bill, um, a lot of the sort of elite um, opinion writers and pundits on TV, none of these people are really embracing the kinds of ideas I'm talking about here today. Most of them, especially the ones who are in power, are 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 trying to to, to fool you into thinking that these minor little tweaks, like rewriting the use of force guidelines for police, or saying that police can only use force under absolute necessary circumstances. And, and you know, all of these, these things are virtually meaningless when, when the kinds of reforms that we need are structural changes to how our society is looking. Um, I worry very much about how this movement will be able to counter a lot of that co-opting. And I wrote an op-ed the other day in Slate um, and did a couple of TV interviews about this concept of how all over the country for, for about a week, you saw police chiefs, marching with protesters, taking off their masks, giving beautiful speeches, kneeling, um, holding people's hands and babies. This is a propaganda effort by police to make you think that the problems that you're seeing are the result of a few bad apple cops. Um, not bad apple cops that created the cash bail system that created mass incarceration, not bad apple cops that created our prison system. It's not bad apple cops that bought themselves tanks and, and tasers and chemical weapons. Um, and so this is a propaganda movement, and I worry about it, about it being co-opted because very, very, very few cities right now in budget season have actually committed to reducing the funding for their police. And, and if they don't do that in this moment, what are they going to do in five or six months when this energy is dissipated? Um, so Dustin, um, I think we're sort of nearing the, the end. Yeah. I know there's some more questions, um, that, but I'm, ne I'm never going to get to all of these questions. Yeah. I think Let's just do, we can just do one more if that's all right with you. If you've got places to be, that's totally okay too. Sure. Do you want, yeah, I've got another meeting at 1230, but do you want to choose the question or do you want me to choose? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just do this one that's at the top. Uh, do you think there are connections between the punishment bureaucracy in American, <clears throat> the American police system and uh, violent foreign policy that we carry out? Yes, I do. I think <clears throat> both are manifestations of who holds power in our society and what interests they want served. Um, both are connected to the profit motive, right? Much of the, you know, foreign policy that we've engaged, there's a really great book actually written a few years ago called Overthrow, which is a description of, it's by Stephen Kinzer, by the description of the, all of the times in the 20th century that the United States used military force abroad. And the through line, and this guy's not a radical, he was a New York Times reporter, but the through line that he came to in studying all of these instances was um, the private profit motive of large American corporations. And that explained better than anything all of the instances of American military aggression throughout the, the 20th century, um, with, with, with a couple of, of notable exceptions. Um, so um, the profit motive is, is at the heart um, of, of both our domestic and our foreign policy. The mindset that um, people who own things want to, want to protect the things that they own is also, I think, at the core of, of both domestic and foreign policy. And I think there are certain pathologies that, that are deeply tied to racism that are really at the core of how we've interacted across the world, whether it's in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, um, the way we've, 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 we've um, acted in Central and South America. Um, I don't think that you can disentangle the racism that led to the creation and expansion of this country and its, its own sort of land conquests and, and banishment of indigenous people um, 
and, and genocide of, of indigenous people to um, like you just can't disconnect those threads with with behavior of, of this country in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos um, and Chile and in Honduras and El Salvador and throughout Latin America and Brazil I and mean, Iran um, throughout Africa. Um, so yeah, I, I think they're all connected. And I think that um, a grassroots, powerful grassroots organizing push to value, um, you know, sort of uh, people and human beings over profit would have tremendously you know, beneficial effects on, on our both their domestic and our foreign policy. So I'm really losing my voice here, Dustin. This has been fantastic. I hope um, you all felt that it was useful to you. And um, I hope you guys will um, do amazing things in the coming months and years. Yeah, this was amazing. This was so informative. Thank you so much, Alec. We really, really appreciate you doing this with us. Yeah, of course. Sorry to keep you a little over. Oh, no worries at all. Um, we'll talk soon, I hope. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.